My name is Nicole Alvarez. We're gonna have a, about an hour session with one of my favorite bands. So please help me welcome Alt-J. I'm gonna stand here with you guys for a little bit. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've got Gus, we've got Tom, we've got Joe. Cameron? Hi, Cameron, nice to meet you. Cameron tours with them. Not a bad gig. So you guys are fresh off of two shows here and you played one of our beloved spots, one of our favorite venues in Southern California, which is the Greek Theater. And the reason we love it is because it has a certain magic and mysticism and mythology all its own. So, Joe, how was playing a venue that, that magical? Because people left there in a surreal state. Uh, yeah, they uh, they liked it. We liked it. We loved playing it. It was good. How much time goes into the live shows? Um, a, well, yeah, a lot of time. Um, <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah, it's kind of um, we've got to make this track sound right when we do play it live because we spend so long recording them. So uh, it's I can't I can't give you a figure or a, or a time, but. Uh, yeah, it takes, takes, takes a while. If money were not an object um, or a factor, do you have things in mind? Because I know there, there was one show that I would have loved to be at. They put a plain clothed choir in the audience, correct? If money were not a factor, what, what would you ideally like to see at an Alt-J live show? It'd be cool to have an orchestra or something. We've never really done that before. We've had sort of bits of other musicians like strings and brass, but having a massive, massive sound like that would be, would be incredible. Okay, this one will go to Tom. Tom, so you grew, you guys met each other in university and you were friends first and you had to play music in the confines of a dorm room and keep it kind of quiet. Do you think that helped shape the sound that is now Alt-J? Uh, definitely, yeah. I think, um, you know, having uh, restrictions like that made us a bit more kind of disciplined. You know, we had to kind of play quieter and, and be more considerate in what we were playing you know and you know definitely the drums it started off very very minimal just a kick drum and a snare drum and, um, and so that definitely had a big impact on the way that we ended up writing and recording yes um, it's we owe a lot to that to that room okay very nice so Gus all of you bring uh, all of you have a unique talent and you all bring something to the table so what would you say are each of your specialties because I know you were a chorister correct yeah I was yeah yeah um yeah, I think um, I sort of come at it from quite a traditional classical approach, which kind of plays nicely with Joe and Tom's more uh, self-taught sort of vibe. I think it's important to have a balance of, of both those things. Um, I think we all have our own roles, yeah. Okay. Joe, you, uh, your voice stands out. It's, it's definitely one of the main things that people talk about because it's so different. Do you remember the first time you ever sung out loud to an audience? even though it was before Alt-J, when you first actually heard yourself sing? Yeah, I sang a lot on my own. I mean, I sang in the shower and stuff. Like, <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't like singing in front of other people because I didn't actually think I had a very good voice. So um, it would just be an embarrassing thing to do. So I kind of just kept to myself, wait, waited for my family to leave the house, and then I just belted <laughs> out. And then, um, I, then I, I went to university and... Um, uh, I met Gwil, that's Cameron, but Cameron. that's where Gwil would have been had he have decided to stay. Um, and uh, he gave me, gave me the confidence to, um, to sing in front of people and I think that was probably when I sang in front of him was probably the first time I sang in public. Very nice. And Tom, I'll go to you for this one since we're on the subject of Gwil. They've done something that other bands cannot do. They've parted with their former bandmate Gwil, but they've managed to stay friends. Let's call it a conscious uncoupling. So everybody was involved and everybody's all good. What do you miss most about having Gwil around? Um, well, you know, we were, we were good friends for a long time and I suppose um, we each have, uh, you know, we each change the dynamic in the group in, in some way and I think Gwil, um, Gwil was very good. I, I used to ask him a lot of questions about whatever and he would always know the answer. So, you know, whether it was advice or, um, you know, why, you know, how does Twitter work, he'll, he'd be able to tell me. And so I, I, kind of, I kind of missed that a little bit, you know, but we are still friends and I, I still do ask him random stuff. 
you know, I'll call him in the middle of the night and just ask him, you know, why, why am I here? <laughs> That's awesome. All right, Gus, to you, I will, uh, I will bring the topic of Miley. Now, in Hunger of the Pine, as you know, Miley Cyrus is featured, and to me, it's, it's, it's extremely haunting. I can't imagine the song without her. Um, did you ever consider anybody else for that part, or was she an original component of the composition of that song? Well, no, I mean, so the, that, that part that she sings comes from her song 4x4, Four Four. so obviously it's just a sample we've lifted from her song, so it wouldn't have been really possible for anyone, anyone else to do it, and I think it's something about stripping her voice of the rest of the track, and it sounds so pure, and like you said, haunting and kind of melancholy. The track itself is quite a jaunty, sort of, kind of country pop song in a way, but taken out of context, it sounds totally different, so we really wanted to use it in our track. Okay, and whichever one of you can answer this one, let's clear up uh, the whole controversy with Left Hand Free. It is reported in the press and in the media that these guys wrote that song to piss off their label. That is untrue. Yeah. However, it was somewhat of a game, right, within the band, so elaborate, please. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of a song that we wrote very quickly. We were having fun one afternoon in our writing studio. Um, you know, it was kind of just an expression of how much we were enjoying each other's company and, you know, making music again together after being on tour for so long. And it was a song that came out sounding really un alt J, but we, we really enjoyed playing it. And so we decided to sort of put it on the album, really. That was it. But I think it was more just that we weren't expecting it to have such a great response from our label as, as they gave it. They really liked it, and we almost thought they might say, no, that's, that's no good. But weirdly, it was the one they liked the best. And there you have it. We cleared that up. Which one of you is the one that thinks the first Spice Girls record is genius? Raise your hand. That's me. Uh, me too. Me too, my friend. You're not alone. So you guys have played many festivals, an incredible company. You've been played on the radio in the United States of America. You've been invited to play at Aaron Paul's house. A member of the Wu-Tang remixed one of your songs. What's left on the Alt-J bucket list? Um, I mean, this, yeah, like you say, we've done so much. We've got so much further than we ever thought we wanted or what we're going to. Um, I think it's just trying to maintain what we have now, you know, rather than let it be sort of something that goes up and then down. We just want to stay at a nice, nice level like this. That'd be great. Okay. Do you want to still ask the question? We have a, a super fan that wants to ask a question. Come up here. Go ahead. Don't be afraid. Don't jump. Don't trip. They don't bite. Or do you? Uh, Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, your inspiration behind the lyrics of Breezebox? Yeah, um, Breezebox is, um, nice to meet you by the way, um, Breezebox is a song about um, sort of like somebody wanted to leave a relationship and uh, the other person not, you know, not wanting them to go, so it's like, you know, that kind of where love kind of can turn sort of dark, you know, you love somebody too much and you, you can't let them go even when they want to, it's kind of the same idea occurs in uh, Where the Wild Things Are, like when uh, Max wants to leave the island and the wild things are like, don't, please don't go, we'll eat you up, we love you so. Sort of like that wanting to, if you can't have that person, then nobody can. You'll, you'll destroy them rather than let them go. It's quite dark. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, if you guys are ready, we're going to step into another world. Please, a round of applause for all Jay. Thank you.